Well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> How's the sound? Thumbs up. Excellent. It's good to be back with you all again. Um, appreciate your sacrificing fall break to come. <laughs> the, kind of the, the last escape to the beach, I, <laughs> we can do that. So as always, the kind of agenda for the time together. I want to do kind of quick review and conclude some of our conversation we were having last session about the villainy of Cain. Then we'll turn to, from that kind of villainous foundation, how that gets racialized. And then as time permits, look at what I call kind of racial theodicy, which is a way of thinking about this question of the mark of Cain and it's a way of addressing questions of theodicy that you see in a lot of various black religious movements. So that's sort of our plan for today. Um, since I mentioned earlier on, I'd like to try to give you a taste of a different, different ways in which people wrestle with this. So to give you a glimpse into how some of black religious traditions have thought through the mark of Cain is what that last piece is about. So we ended our time together on Sunday with the story of 1 John 3 as an example of the reception of the mark of Cain, or in particular the story of Cain. And what we talked about, and a lot of kind of interesting questions were percolating about how Cain emerges as this intense villain in 1 John, which is different than what we saw in Genesis 4. So if you remember in Genesis 4, there's no claim that Abel is righteous, there's no claim that he's innocent. But when we get to 1 John, you know, he's this righteous man who basically is God's first cousin. Cain is of the devil, of the evil one. He killed his brother because his deeds were wicked. And we talked about, well, how do you get there? And so we talked about a couple of moments in the text. So in Genesis 4, there's that odd phrase where... Um, the writer says that Eve has said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And so they raise this question of how do you acquire a man? Now, typically when you give birth to a male child, it's a child, not a man. So that got into various speculations about maybe there's some supernatural origin story to it. Then the second thing we looked at was in Genesis 4.11, there's this phrase in Hebrew, Arulata, says, incursed are you. And that same phrase appears earlier in Genesis in connection to the serpent. And we talked about, just a quick review, who was the serpent in Christian tradition? Exactly, Satan. And so the idea becomes you have two characters who get cursed by God. The serpent slash Satan in Genesis 3, Cain in Genesis 4. So if they both are labeled the same thing, then there's a connection that gets drawn between them. And so that becomes part of what seems to be in the backdrop of how 1 John 3 can get Cain not only as a villain, but to be one of the devil and one of those children of light versus children of darkness, which we talked a bit about in our second class. The piece we got to at the very end was how does this kind of relate to the earlier theme I talked about of the three Ds of blackness, right? And it's my way of capturing sort of a constellation of ideas that the Bible gets used to define blackness as dangerous, depraved, and deviant. Part of what I started talking toward the end of our class on Sunday was that we get Cain as this demonic, devilish character. And if someone is demonic or devilish, it's easy to argue they are also dangerous. They're also depraved, and they're also deviant. So we saw that in 1 John when it talks about he was a murderer, and he was a murderer of the brethren. This is probably not controversial. That's really dangerous. That's kind of depraved, and that's kind of deviant. Right? And for the sake of my soul, we all say, yes, amen. Killing brothers is bad. Right? <laughs> Public service announcements, if one gains nothing else, killing brothers, bad, right? And so it's easy to then understand how that, those kinds of associations get attached. The last piece that I wanted to mention, and we'll unpack this a little bit more in our time together today, is in the context of Genesis 4, a number of Hebrew Bible scholars have talked about what I describe as the juridical context. That's a fancy way of saying Genesis 4 kind of reads like a trial story. The importance of that 
is that Cain, it becomes argued, is deemed guilty by God. The ultimate judge has found him guilty of murder. And if Cain is a murderer and he's a type of human being, then everyone who comes from Cain is also declared by God to be murderers. How'd they make that So they make that leap in two ways. Um, leap one is what we saw in 1 John, where Cain and Abel become types of human beings. The second way they make that leap is they look at the, the literal legal terminology that appears in Genesis 4 to recognize that Cain is, is actually judged and found guilty from how the text is written. So they then, so they have that kind of truth, but then they add the leap of, well, Cain is a type of person from whom blacks descend. And we'll get to how they say blacks come from Cain in a moment. Uh, but that's how they make that leap. You're like, I don't like the leap. <laughs> well, is that where they get the whole sins of the father are carried down to the third and fourth generation? In business? part, yes, in part. Um, because part of what they will argue here is that the divine judgment means that everyone who is from Cain, we carry in us the same kind of evil spirit, the, the same dispositions, and obviously through the mark, which we'll, which we'll look at in a few moments, that lets everyone know who belongs to Cain. Well, we have easy answers to that. It comes the argument. Yes? Is it the whole Adam and Eve being thrown out of Eden, the original sin that we're all born of? I mean, how do they reconcile that? Right, so the part of how that gets reconciled, um, I'm thinking specifically right now, uh, Josiah Strong, Josiah Priest, excuse me, does this. What he argues is that Adam and Eve are put all of human beings under sin. But then there are degrees of sinfulness. And there are degrees of sinfulness which connect to the possibility of redemption. So the argument eventually becomes, yes, all of us, you know, to quote Paul, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But some of us have really fallen. Right? And again, you know, we can all imagine whoever your person is you like the least. You know, we have very colorful ways of describing, yeah, I'm bad, but not like them. Right? And so Cain becomes one of the standard not like them. So throughout the history of Christianity, when you want to other a group, Cain becomes one of the figures. So there's some very kind of disturbing anti-Semitic parts of the Christian tradition where the descendants of Cain are attached to Jews. In this country, blackness becomes the ultimate other in many ways. So that's how it gets attached that way. Yes, exactly, exactly. If you read Gerard, who's massive, tomes on why scapegoating is essential for human survival. Cool. So that's kind of where we were. Uh, questions, queries on that before we jump back into Cain. Yes, sir. I have a question. You, uh, you refer to they make this argument. I understand it's the white supremacists that have adopted this argument. How broad is that and which direction is it going? Are more people buying into this argument, because this argument is pretty uh, detailed. I mean, it, it requires mm -hmm. a lot of study to make the argument. Right. Is it uh, a growing movement? Is it uh, declining? And is it in, and who would you define as they other than white supremacist? Yeah, so I would sort of do it in two different eras. So do kind of antebellum, postbellum America. Antebellum America, this is the dominant argument. If you were to ask the average person in 1758 or 1858, why are black people enslaved? Why are they in the state they're in? They will probably give you two answers. Mark of Cain and the curse of Ham, which is what we'll close our last two classes with. So this was common at that time. What most American religious historians argue is by the time we get to the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, this mark of Cain in the explicit tech, uh, kind of terms begins to drop out. And what dominates more in that context 
or some of the arguments we talked about about the Genesis 1 segregation arguments, Genesis 10 in the Table of Nations, then how that gets received in Acts 17. So that continues to grow. In 21st century context, and again, please use private browsing and alert all of employees and spouses of if you do the following searches. Just, I don't want you to get in trouble. Um, this story reappears and spikes in around 2013. Um, they have rebranded themselves. I think they now call themselves the Christian Identity Church, but they were at one point the White Identity Church. And what they argue is that we as white Americans are the descendants of righteous Abel. And we have to exterminate all of the wicked Cains because they are a threat to our survival. And they revisit the mark of Cain as a racial designation for anyone who is non-white American. Um, so that argument continues. Um, as we'll talk about in a few moments, the vestige of this argument isn't in that people argue about the mark of Cain. The argument is that they still think of blackness as being dangerous, as being demonic, as being depraved. So that, I think that's the fruit that lives. But the actual mark of Cain, you're right, there are very few outside of that cadre of the white identity church and their, the tentacles that connect to that, that still actively use the same kind of exegesis that you saw in World War prior to, excuse me, the Civil War. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think this is maybe asking for one more affirmation of what you just said, that we're, we're really talking about reception, a specific kind of reception history here with regard to the First John passage, because you do get some sort of interesting allegorization, allegorizations sometimes in the New Testament of Old Testament passages of which we have very little detail. Right. And so that's kind of a thing. It happens and it doesn't mean, you know, the writer is completely, uh, you know, off the cliff or anything. Right. Uh, so you do get some of that kind of thing. You also get uh, uh, rabbinical uh, hyperbole where... Uh, you know, Jesus said uh, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Um, and so that doesn't mean we have a bad canon. It just means that right. we don't get to apply that racially, right? Right. Uh, so. Yeah, exactly. And so part of, I think, the argument is always, and it's good to remind us of that, is that tracing this tradition is not saying this is the tradition that the Bible itself endorses, but rather it gains inertia, the force of normalcy. So that if we were, well, we would not be sitting here 150 years ago, but hypothetically, <laughs> in that bizarre universe, if we were all sitting here 150 years ago, right, this is like the hashtag movement. We all know what a hashtag is, even if we've never used one in our life. We know it. That's what these kind of racialized interpretations are. Even if you've never used it, you know it. Saw two hands. One, two. Yeah. Um, that group you were just talking about of justifying, you know, slavery, et cetera, because, well, we, you know, we got to mess with them before they mess with us. Yeah. Seems to kind of go against the grain of this certain phrase I've heard about, you know, do unto others as you would have them do, uh, right. do to you. Do unto others before they do unto you. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, exactly. That's clause B of it. And it just feeds into this whole problem. We got a faith, you know, right. driven by fear, driven by paranoia. Right, absolutely. Right. Exactly. And part of how kind of the framework that you talked about earlier, how that gets invoked, is a lot of what ends up happening is this question of the heathen. So whatever the heathen is, that allows us to not apply the golden rule to them. And so part of what's in the backdrop of all of this, and there's a scholar at Stanford who's done a wonderful book on this recently, is the more you can make someone heathen, the less the ethical principles of scripture seem to apply to them. And once you can do that, you know, the, the tale of horrors that we could spend several lifetimes describing flow very easily. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a request for advice. Um, 
walking here, I was taking my daughter, so I didn't to so I didn't stop. Maybe I should have. But I overheard two men talking, and they said, "I'm not going to that class. Talking about this class because it's taught by a racist," mm-hmm. which I strongly disagree with. All right. You are what you're teaching is are facts, and they're hard things, particularly for white people to 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 face and and work with. But I'd like to go back and have a conversation with those men. How would you advise starting a conversation with somebody about this topic that where they are so that this so threatens their narrative? When you said that, I said, yeah. "Bingo, that's it." Yeah. So, because so, so, we need all of us in this room need to be having those conversations, and they're hard conversations to have. Right. So. What would you advise us to do? Yeah. Um, so I can talk about what I have tried. Um, has worked sometimes, hasn't worked in others. The first is to begin by affirming what they feel. The worst thing to do is when someone feels that they are being dismissed is to dismiss them. The worst thing to do when someone feels under attack is to actually attack them. So begin as much as possible by affirming their feelings and affirming how they then think about the world in reaction to that. Then, depending on the nature of the relationship, it's to probe. So, okay, so what bothered you about that? What led you to that conclusion? And as you said, invariably, it's about some core belief being threatened, right? And so in the 26th session version of this, uh, which is what I teach in the semester, I talk about the idea of core beliefs and what that triggers in us that the attack on the Capitol in 2021 makes perfect sense. Because what it means is everything I hold sacred is being disrespected, dismissed, and demonized. And I will not let my country die without a fight. That makes perfect sense. I would argue it is wrong, but it makes perfect sense. And so be able to enter into that conversation where they understand that I understand. Then try to ask, let's start peeling back the onion. And so one of the reasons you heard me mention in class, I don't use the word racist. In the work that my wife and I do, we we don't use that term. We use the term live white supremacy. And we ask, how are all of us affected by it? So the racist thing immediately puts up walls. I'm not racist. I'm not asking if you are. I'm asking, how has the live white supremacy affected you? And so then that requires definitions. Well, what do I mean by the lie of white supremacy? How do I see it living? And so to begin that process of saying, so what we are dealing with is a disease. It's COVID-19 spiritually. We all going to get it. Prayerfully, we can be vaccinated so we don't die from it. But we all going to get it. So how then do we start a treatment plan? And so it's to begin that process. And hopefully, depending on the nature of the relationship and the conversation, to start asking, so when you make this argument, so, you know, if you make the argument, which we'll read in a, in a moment, that uh, Phyllis Wheatley, who one of my f- favorite people, um, will talk about the mark of Cain as it applies to so-called Negroes and what that comes to mean about the Negroes' place in the church and in society. So then let's unpack what she's saying and implications of that to try to get a different framework. Um, so that's what I've tried to do, um, depending on the nature of the relationship and where the person is, determines how successful that has been. But that's part of what I've tried to do, um, to, again, acknowledge how they are feeling, why that triggers certain processes of thinking, and then try to say, can we get behind that to ask, so what's really at stake for you? you know, I mean, as you said, it's an uncomfortable conversation, right? Because since all of this is factual and true and verifiable, That threatens that myth of innocence we talked about in class one. Uh, Stephen Haynes talks about there's this deep sense of Southern honor that is in the backdrop of all of these things. And so what's at stake is not am I racist, what's at stake is you're threatening my honor as a man, my dignity as a Southern gentleman. And if you fight that, if you threaten that, do unto you before you do unto me. And so all that gets triggered. And so being able to contextualize that I found at times helpful. 
No problem. But we can have a longer offline conversation as well, but that's, that's the starting point for me. Cool. On the screen, for sake of time, we won't read, read it. Um, but if we go back to Genesis 4, where it all starts, the question is, how do we get from here to racialization? The great secret text, starting in verse 10, where God confronts Cain and is like, what have you done? What's going on with your brother? God then judges him and casts him out. And Cain says, before you cast me out, your judgment is too harsh for me. Because if I'm thrown out from society, someone will find me and they'll kill me. Then God says, the Joel Kemp paraphrase, my bad, you're right. So I'm going to put a mark on you so that anyone who sees that mark knows they cannot kill you, lest they be subject to divine vengeance. When the Bible is silent, human imagination runs wild. So, how does it run wild from there? So the first question is, what is the mark that God puts on Cain? It's okay to say, we have no idea. How many say, we have no idea? Yeah, well, <laughs> if it was visible, yeah, I always thought it was something on the head right here. Right, exactly. Right, so we assume it has to be something visible because it does no good. It's our mark, you so anyone who sees it knows not to touch you, right? A back tattoo wearing a sweater and two shirts is useless, right? So it has to somehow be visible, and many people think something on the forehead, okay? Other possibilities. You say? Yeah, it could be his race, absolutely. Could be a birthmark, right? In an odd moment in church history, how many of you ever heard of the boxer Mike Tyson? <laughs> All right. What does Mike Tyson have on his face right now? A face tattoo, right. In my mind, that's what I think the mark is. Yeah. It's a giant face tattoo. Can't prove it. Probably ain't true, but it, it, it does well for my personal theology to think that Cain had a giant face tattoo. So every time I think, see Mike Tyson, I'm like, yes, I have proof that my theory is right. <laughs> Right, so again, so we assume it's something visible. One possibility is that it can become race. According to Genesis 4, what is the purpose of the mark? So no one will hurt him. Yeah. Right. Well, that didn't work out later, did it? Exactly. So this becomes one of the central questions about the interpretive trajectory of this story. The mark, according to Genesis, is a sign of protection. How does it then become a sign for human subjugation. That's the big flip in the reception of this story. And we get it in part because of the divine judgment argument we talked about before and Cain being of the devil. Several commentators have talked about this. <laughs> uh, well, I won't name the name to protect the guilty. My favorite version of this is the Bible is unfair to Cain. He gets away with too much stuff. Right? Because after the story ends, Cain goes over and builds, he finds a random woman. We talked about where she came from as a mystery. They have a bunch of kids and they build great civilizations. That is deeply dissatisfying for several people. So where God did not do the judgment, he reserved it for us to complete his judgment. Yes, ma'am. Without looking at the exact wording in the scripture again, I mean, is, is the assumption then that everyone else is going to know exactly how to interpret the mark? Yeah. I mean, so the, the, we've yeah. Told, he's told Cain what the mark represents, but what about everyone who encounters Cain? Right, exactly. The assumption is that everyone who encounters Cain will know what the mark means. Hmm. But you're right. That's one of the things that the text leaves, leaves open. Right. Thank you. Yeah. And last thing on that before we jump for time. Is the mark of Cain inheritable? No, 
Right. Exactly. That is clearly put on Cain to protect Cain. It says nothing that it goes to his children, his grandchildren, or anyone else. But if it's racial, then it's self-evidently inheritable. So these gaps that the text leaves, how will we know, to whom does it belong, all get filled through this kind of very sort of live white supremacist understanding of the biblical worldview, so that the mark of Cain becomes blackness. Blackness, like the mark, is a sign of judgment. It's a sign of judgment that is inheritable to everyone who bears that mark. An example of how common this was is Phyllis Wheatley. How many have heard of Phyllis Wheatley before? Okay. Most. So Phyllis Wheatley was kidnapped from the continent of Africa and brought to America as an enslaved young girl. She lives in around what, 1750 to 1784, so about 30 years. She writes perhaps her most famous work on being brought from Africa to America. Depending on which historian is telling the, the story, she is either the first African American to be published, the first African American woman to be published, and maybe even the first woman to be published. That third point is more under dispute, but the first two are more widely accepted. In this context, I want to draw attention to the last four lines of that stanza. So some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes black as Cain, may be refined and join the angelic train. We were asking earlier, Jim, about kind of the nature of this and how widespread it is. I often like using her as an example because this is a woman who gets here as a teenager and knows that the mark of Cain is somehow connected to blackness. Well, so how did, how did Cain get to be black? I mean, he's got the same parents as, as Abel, right? Right. So one, one possibility is if he's a child of the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then. That starts out and you've got somehow, you know, Adam knew her, right? Right. And somehow the devil slipped in and cuckolded him, right? right? With God's help. Right. Come on. Right. <laughs> the second answer to how Cain becomes black is what the mark represents it in Genesis 4.15. So this mark that's placed upon him gets understood as that diabolic die. That his sin changes his physical appearance and changes him from white, the painting from week one, to black. Yes. So... She when did she write this? Was she still a teenager when she wrote it, or was she? I don't remember her exact age when she wrote it. So, so somehow, well, yeah. her, whatever her upbringing, I mean, we're, she must have gotten that here. I mean, Correct. somehow she, that got into her head here. Right, exactly. She did not invent this. Right. right. Well, I, I taught American studies, and I, this, is, this is one of my favorite poems because it says so much to me. And I would read the Remember Christians a little bit more cynically um, because I yeah. think she's so wise and yeah. her and audience is not. But um, she um, was ch challenged as the author of her work. And, but she was, tr she was um, bought by slave masters in Boston, yeah. and they actually educated her. Correct. And um, a lot of her education was biblical scripture yep. and the poetry of earlier English poets like 16th to 15th right. century. So that's, she gets a lot of her language and her biblical right. background. So that, does that help you think no, about it? I mean, she didn't, she was taught that. Correct. Right, and so part but of- she got it. She understood it. She yeah. understood what they were saying. You know, exactly. You know, Right, and so part of what that last nine, last two lines, remember Christians and Negroes black as Cain may be refined and join the angelic train. What a number of people have argued, and I like it, so I, I endorse it, um, is this is her critique of the whole concept. Because what she is arguing is yes, I'll accept that we are black as Cain, but that's not the end of our story. 
We have the capacity to be refined, redeemed. The sin that covers Adam and Eve, the same Christ that redeemed all of their children can redeem all of Cain's children. So she's arguing, many have, many have suggested, that these two lines are her way of saying Christ has to be more powerful than that diabolic die. And so therefore, we too, by coming to Christ, can be set free from that. So the permanent cast of blacks as these this diabolic die runs contrary to the Christian faith. So that's part of how many people understand that la those last two lines. Uh, yes, sir. So the mark of Cain is blackness. Yes. Say it again, because the, yeah, the so mark the of Cain is blackness. Correct. That's how it becomes understood. Um, and just to give, as Mike goes to Sam, um, just to give an, an example, another example of this. Um, Brigham Young. How many have heard of Brigham Young? Okay. He is by no means unique in what he says, but I appreciate the kind of bluntness of his argument. And this is in 1859. Yes, 1859. I should just read the screen rather than memory. 1859, um, where he's talking about the mark of Cain to your question of is it blackness? So, you see some classes of the human family. So yay, we're human, right? So polygenesis, he doesn't buy. Awesome. That are black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, and low in their habits, wild and seemingly deprived of nearly all the blessings of the intelligence that is generally bestowed upon mankind. Well, bleep. Like, I love you too, Brigham Young. All right. Then he goes into the story where we just were. Cain slew his brother. Cain might have been killed and that was but a termination to that line of human beings. This was not to be. And the Lord put a mark upon him, which is the flat nose and black skin. So it goes beyond just skin tone, but to the phenotypical characteristics that define Negroes of the African race. And again, this was common. That if you were to roll into churches between 1640 and 1865, you would have heard these kinds of things. Um, as an interesting footnote, I had a student who was born in 1999, took my class when I read this quotation. I will not repeat her exact words because we were in church, but it was a series of expletives saying, that's what I was taught in vacation Bible school. And this was a young white woman from a large, prominent church who had this taught to her. And she was born in 1999. So again, is it the norm like it was in 1799? No, but it absolutely still exists. Yes. Um, I just th thank you for the reference to Phyllis Wheatley. And I was completely unfamiliar with that. But um, you, you can flag us away if this is irrelevant. but. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation now. People are discrediting all religions because they say every religion it was somebody's invention to maintain a certain meta narrative of dominance. You know, mm -hmm. and and a lot of people that oppose the Christian faith altogether will say, look at slaveholders and slaves. But to me, to me, the Phyllis Wheatley thing is a very um, Beautiful example, uh, at least argues possibly for the validity of Christian faith as a subversive um, witness, because even though she was taught, she was uh, inculcated by her slave masters as to their version of uh, subjugating Christian faith, uh, she and so many others seem to take the very faith they were taught to use the very principles they were taught and to turn it on, uh, in a sense, their, their masters in a very subversive way. Does that right. ring true? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so there's a long tradition. And I think the analogy I often use in class with students is, to me, the Bible is a knife. Mm -hmm. In the hand of a surgeon, it's life-giving. In the hands of an ax murderer, it's death dealing. So the question is, how do we, as interpreters and handlers of the text, do everything in our power to be God's surgeons, rather than the devil's serial killers? My wife is fond of saying, 
everything humans touch have the capacity to be corrupted. Yeah. And human history tells us everything we have touched, we have corrupted. So, again, in those conversations I have with people, if you're going to reject religion because it's corrupted, then you need to throw out the natural sciences. Everything regarding obstetrics and gynecology came at the cost of my wife and my sisters. So throw all that out. Right? So if, if you're going to be logically consistent, then be a nihilist. And I respect nihilists. I would not want to be one. But there's a logical integrity to that. So I appreciate that. If we're not going to do that, then have the recognition that everything humans touch can be a knife or an axe murderer's tool. And particularly for Christians, what do we do to make sure we are God's surgeons and not the devil's killers? Yes, sir. Um, I think I have to give you the mic. I'm sorry for the Coming. people Coming. who are. I'm wondering, looking at Brigham Young's words and seeing that they were written in 1859, how much of that do you think was influenced by Darwin's origin of the species, which I think was published in 1858? Yeah. And I, I understand that that, intellectually and maybe the bible was just something that they ended up using to talk about it but it was the origin of the species and that intellectual movement that influenced a lot of the ways people began to write about and think about race yeah absolutely so what uh scholars who talk about polygenesis one of the things they'll talk about is that it was the perfect marriage in the late 19th century of this kind of kind of racialized biblical readings and a racialized application of Darwinism. So those two things, you know, Adam knew Eve, right? Polygenesis knew Darwinism. And these are part of the products that get the result of that marriage. So you're absolutely right. There's that confluence of those intellectual traditions. Um, much longer conversation of how those two get decoupled, if they do. Um, but as we talked briefly about, I think it was in class two, um, polygenesis as a Christian doctrine eventually gets rejected by the end of the 19th century um, under the weight primarily of the most conservative Christian interpreters. Um, but as I argued, the damage that was done is what still lingers. But you're absolutely right. There is that confluence of those two intellectual traditions um, that informs part of what we see here. Last thing on, on this piece. I talked about the three D's of blackness, dangerousness, depravity, and deviance. Do you see those in Brigham Young's quotation? Yeah, All right. And so part of why I like to use that label for three D's is that it's a way of trying to summarize what are you trying to capture in this Mark of Cain? What are you trying to capture in these racialized readings? And that's part of what we see here. For time, do a couple quick things. As I mentioned at the end of our first class, I tend to build each section around a couple of syllogisms as ways of what are the bite-sized things to take home. So you may remember from our first class this whole kind of logical syllogism, right? A equals B. If A equals C, then B equals C, right? The, I won't make you do the math version of it. But like if 4 plus 0 equals 2 plus 2, and 4 plus 0 equals 3 plus 1, then we can say 2 plus 2 equals 3 plus 1. I'm sorry. It's the last time I make you do math ever. <laughs> I always have to do math at least twice every semester, so we just do it once here. So we talked about at the end of that first class the picture of Adam and Eve. Now, most of us don't really care about the race of Adam and Eve in modern contexts. The race of Jesus, however, becomes much more of a contested issue. So in the fuller version of this class, I invite students, well, I don't invite them, they're required <laughs> um, to watch part of the Malcolm X movie by Spike Lee. How many of you have ever seen that movie? A handful of people, okay. So there's the scene that I ask them to watch is when Malcolm Little, who before he converts to Malcolm X, which as a footnote, my wife's great aunt knew Malcolm Little as a kid and had him over to her house, which is just really cool. Like, <laughs> Her great aunt had dinner with Malcolm Little. Like, that's a cool story. Um, but in that scene where Brother Bain is talking to Malcolm Little, he asks Malcolm Little, look up the word white in the dictionary. And they read, white is good, innocent, pure, noble, 
of no ill intentions, et cetera. What I do in my class when students do that, I ask them, take out the word white and put Jesus. Is Jesus good? Is Jesus innocent? Is Jesus pure? Is Jesus without negative motivations or ill intent? And I want them to do that to help them understand the power of this syllogism. That if I racialize Jesus as white, every attribute that attaches to Jesus, by implication, I can attach to white. Using this false syllogism, A, well the syllogism is valid logically, the data is wrong. And so going back to your question about how do we have these conversations, some of the things that I try to do is help them see this is part of what's in the background. So to critique whiteness is to critique godliness. So I had a student, who shall again remain names to protect the guilty, who was like, Dr. Kemp, you think, aren't you a racist because you hate Jesus? And I was like, why would I hate another black man and call him racist? <laughs> and that was wrong. I was, I was, you know, right. But then my serious response was, tell me what you are assuming about this Jesus and about me to make that claim. By the end of the class, when we got to this syllogism, he came up to me a week later, tearful, like, I didn't realize I believed that. And then that started an interesting journey with this student. Second syllogism, which is what we're wrapping up for today. Cain is black. Right? Cain is villainous, which is, right, is what 1 John 3 tells us. So how do we then finish the syllogism? Black is villainous. All one needs to do is go on now X, formerly Twitter, pull up any news feed. Every day you see examples of black being villainous. The argument of Cain as black has largely dropped. Right? In the article that got banned in Pennsylvania, one of the things I argue is about this syllogism. And if you go back and look at police reports of many unarmed black men, and I use two examples, Rodney King, which is my generation, and Michael Brown, which for many started the Black Lives Matter movement, or at least was like the flashpoint for it. Two cops separated by over 20 years and 2,000 miles describe both of those black men as demons, as monsters, fearing for my safety, so I had to do that. Black is villainous, black as three Ds, is part of that syllogism that I argue continues to live. And if we understand some of this background, then perhaps we can create a counter to that. I was given the five minute warning, I have three minutes left if my watch is right. So I want to do one last thing. And so this concept of black religious movements and racialized theodicy. How many have heard of the term theodicy before? Theodicy. Theodicy. So theodicy, at its most basic, is what I put on the screen of how can an omnipotent, that is an all-powerful, and an omnibenevolent, that is an all-good God, how do those two things coexist with evil? Right, that's, you know, Systematic theologians, there are like four different versions of theodicy, which if you take systematic theology, you will nuance ad nauseum. A good working definition, all good, all powerful God, how is there evil? Make that make sense to me. The term racialized theodicy is a term that I use to ask, can you answer the question of the existence of evil using racial paradigms? In particular, within black religious movements, can you explain black suffering by appealing to whiteness or the lie of white supremacy? There are numerous traditions that do exactly that. There's an article by a scholar named Dr. Junior called The Mark of Cain and White Violence. The Mark of Cain and White Violence, where she goes through some of the various histories of this narrative. The story that gets the most attention 
is the story in 2 Kings 5, which is the story of Gehazi and Elisha. How many have heard or remember that story of Gehazi and Elisha? Okay. So this is the, <laughs> right, Dr. Lamont was like, yes. <laughs> uh, so the very, very short version of this story is Elisha, there's a Syrian general, Naaman, who is suffering from leprosy. He then travels down south to Israel to be healed by dipping in the Jordan River seven times. Elisha has a servant named Gehazi. Elisha agrees, I'll heal you, no charge. Gehazi is like, eh, I don't like that. So he runs and chases after Naaman and says, here's Elisha's cash app, hook him up. Loose translation. Elisha says, my spirit went with you, Gehazi, and I know you charged him money when I said not to do it. So therefore, the leprosy that clung to him, and in verse 27, let it cling to you and your seed forever. This is where racialized theology enters black religious movements. They begin by arguing, since these texts take place in Africa and in Asia, what's the most likely skin tone of those individuals? Right, they're dark, they're brown or black. So making a, a brown man black is not a really significant mark. So we need something else. So they argue, well, maybe whiteness becomes the sign of judgment that changes their skin tone, which makes them stand out. The Gehazi story becomes central because one of the effects of leprosy in some medical journals is that it changes the skin a pinkish white tone. And here, it is a judgment that lasts upon their seed forever. That's, we don't know it's forever for Cain. We do know it's forever for Gehazi. Then in these black religious movements, they then argue, if whiteness is a judgment that attaches to seed forever, what would we expect from the descendants of Cain if they too suffered the same thing? So David Walker and others will argue, most famously, the Nation of Islam picks up this. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, how many have heard of him? Yeah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, yeah. So in their kind of theological anthropology, they argue what group of people have committed more crimes, done more kidnapping, done more murdering? Right. And so their argument in these black religious movements is that our white Christian brothers and sisters got it right, but inverted it. Evil can be explained by race, just they got the race backwards. So part of the effect, and I'll close because I think I have 30 seconds left, <laughs> um, of how this lives today in various black religious movements you have the same idea of how can we use race as a way of understanding suffering, understanding the world order. And so you get this inversion in black religious movements that says the mark of Cain is about race, but it's not about blackness, it's about whiteness. And so you get these interesting traditions, one growing to explain domination, the other to explain subjugation. And they are at war in very fascinating, in some ways, very painful ways for our country. Stop there for next week. We'll pick up the curse of Ham and the table of nations, and that'll wrap up our time again. You want to pick up with this one? Okay. <laughs> I can pick up with that. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>